I went to Magic Johnson's opening of Magic Johnson's Theater in Crenshaw Mall. Years ago? Years ago when it first happened. And it was a big grand opening with all these celebrities and everything. And I met Shaq for the first time there that I recall. Because we're both from Newark. But anyway, so I spoke to him and everything. We knew mutual people, his relatives, know my relatives, and so on and so forth. So I was standing there talking to him, looking at this dude. And I realized that his two of my thighs made up one of his. And I was like, this, I know some tall dudes, but this is the biggest human being I know I've ever met, ever. And on top of being big and all that, he's just one of the most wonderful people. One of the nicest people you'll ever meet, ever, period. I worked with him in Vegas. So one day, I call up Jelly Bean, and I'm like, Bean, I got, I, yo, man, I got a new TV. I want to watch the games. Because, you know, we talk about the games and everything when the games are in process, process, especially when the Lakers are playing. And I was like, I got this new TV. It's a new LG, you know, flat screen, because I used to have this big old bubble back TV like he did. And, you know, we used to talk about whatever. So I'm like, yo, I want to brag about this new TV I just bought at Best Buy. And I come on, I call him, la, 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 la. He's like, yo, man, Shaq just bought me three of those. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. I said, I was wondering how I was going to get the, my big bubble back down from, my, from upstairs. He called, he got some, some big Samoan guys to come and pick him up and take it out of the house like it was a toothpick or something. I was like, what? So, yeah, man, I mean, I, you know, he's about 6'10". Shaq's like 7'2 or 7'1, something like that. And I just, you know, I, I just con don't consider myself that big. I'm just a dude, man. Most of my friends are taller than me, man. Who, who is the most impressive athlete you ever came across? You've seen them all. Well, I've seen a lot of them. I, you know, that's hard to, to, to know because, see, I met some guys like Sam Jones. People don't even know who Sam Jones is. Sam Jones played on the Celtics and... You know, we were talking, you know, one time in particular about shooting. And everybody loves Steph, and I love Steph. He, he definitely one of the greatest shooters. But Sam could actually shoot repeatedly from half-court bank shots. I'm like, what? Like, he has 10 rings. You know, Russell obviously has 11. Most people know that. But, you know, there was a, there's been a lot of great ones. So who's the greatest guys? The guys that created the move or the guys that imitated and took it someplace else? I don't know the answer to that question. You know, um, you know, it took, you know, Elgin Baylor and Connie Hawkins to create a Julius Irving Who to then turn Magic. around and create Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan to then turn around and create a Kobe Bryant. You know, it took a, a, a Oscar Robinson and, you know, a Magic Johnson to create a LeBron James. So in eras, they're different. But one thing I can say about all of them that are great, they're great for a reason. They're not great because they went, woke up like, oh, I want to be great. They woke up, they, they got up every day, worked their asses off, worked harder than everybody they knew, and became what they eventually became. They're not realizing who they were going to eventually become to everyone else. They just wanted to be the best they could be. Everyone stands on everyone else's shoulders. Yeah, and they absolutely, without a question. You know, if you pay attention, you appreciate the journey more. If you don't pay attention, you take too much for granted, and you don't really, you don't really appreciate everything that you're getting or becoming. Larry Bird seems to really understand that. Man, Larry Bird. <laughs> Larry Bird helped me get one of my kids a scholarship. Yeah, dude. you told me that last time. Man, I'll never forget, forget that guy, ever, 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 ever forget him. Um, and he didn't have to do that, you know what I mean? That shows you his heart. You know, even when he was coaching, I think the only reason why he stopped because I think his health started bothering him. But he was, you know, you could tell by the way he was coaching. He's a, he's a people person. You know, whenever you're a people person, you could end up being a good coach, especially if you can understand people and know how to relate to them and, and talk to them, you know, and appeal, appeal to their logic. You're you're a mentor to so many young kids. Yeah, I've been. That kind of comes with the territory when you call yourself a coach. Some people take it as a title, like Mister, and it's not. It's bigger than that. I've seen some video clips of you with your kids, and it's like they're pretty touching. Oh, I you. I just remember I'm a kid, man. I'm just an older kid. But you love these kids. Yeah, because people 
gave to me, poured them to me, put themselves into me. And I, you know, try to, to keep that gift, I gotta give back the same way it was given to me and be genuine with it. Because kids can read you, they read you in a minute. Like, they know in 30 seconds if you're full, full of doo-doo. Um, and they can tell when you're genuine. And when you're genuine, they'll go through a wall for you. You know, you ask them to jump, and they'll say, how high, and when do you want me to come down? Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, and, I, and I'm a kid. I'm a, just a big kid, older, learned a few lessons along the way. And because I remain in that space mentally, it's easy for me to, to communicate with them, really. It's not hard. Do you feel like life is getting better for everyone or do you think things are falling apart? <sighs> life in general. Our leaders are not as honest as they need to be. You know, the media is not as honest as it needs to be. And shit rolls downhill, man. And, you know, if you're not gonna help these kids, if you're not gonna really be honest with these kids and honest with each other, because these kids are reading everything we do, and they do more of what we do than what we say, this planet's in real trouble. Fortunately, the kids are waking up and they have more access to information than I could even have imagined when I was a kid. But uh, if we are, if our leaders don't take hold of themselves, especially here in America, man, because the world looks to us. I didn't realize that much until I left the country how much people look up to America, man. It's like amazing. And, and people are people, no matter where they live, it doesn't matter. You, you do the best you can with what you have, but they look to us, you know, really to show the way, like, you know. And if America can get itself back together again, instead of being so divisive, I think we got a chance. If we don't, as Mr. T used to say, I pity the fools. You know, we're really gonna learn to live together as brothers or we're gonna die as fools. You know, that's that's for real. Yeah. What what I see with young people today, especially young men, something that seems to maybe, maybe it's just my age that I see things differently, but it seems like courage is what's lacking in this new generation. <clears throat> courage is interesting. Courage comes from being confronted with an obstacle and making a decision about what you're going to do with it. And these kids are now being confronted with some major obstacles. Now, how they decide what they're going to do with it is going to be very, very interesting. And every time and every period in life, as we look through the cycles of humanity, we see people rising above the obstacles that they've had. Um, and they'll find a way, because humanity's, you know, we're humans and we are, our struggle to survive is very powerful. We'll find a way to be heroic. I mean, so many of the guys need guys that are positive as examples of what courage is. I think that's the courage you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And too many times we don't see a lot of those guys. Too many times we see guys want to just be politically correct or they don't even know. They do what they think Hollywood says you're supposed to do about being a man. Um, too many of them are raised by women who Please forgive me, women, if you're out there listening. There's no offense to you, but you can't raise a man. You can help him a little bit of the way, but a man has to help a man become a man, really. And I'm not talking about the men that are, you know, don't respect women or anything like that. I'm not talking about that in any way. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite way around. The, the guys that respect women are the best gentlemen that there are um, because they respect themselves. But there are choices in the way we think about things, the way we approach things. You know, truly, we're hunters. We are hunters. You are gatherers. You teach us to gather. You teach us to be intuitive and those things that help us with our hunting. But we need to learn about hunting from men. We need to learn about protection from men. We need to learn about how to love and take care and nurture our women from men who teach us how to do that. You can't teach us how to, you can teach us how, what you want, but not how to do it. It's my opinion. Mm-hmm. I'll stick to it for now. But you, you think things are getting better or worse than when you were young? <laughs> Many things have gotten better. I mean, 
You know, I remember getting called a nigger in a basketball game. And I remember taking a ball, faking it over his head, and he turned around, and I tried to break his nose with the ball. I got taken out of the game, it was a foul. You know, back then they didn't have what they call them now. They weren't those, you know. Technicals. Technical, no, they were, it was, well, they call them, <laughs> they have uh, they, these real fierce, fierce names for them now, which will get you thrown out of the game. But back then it was just like a foul, so they just give you a foul. So my coach took me out of the game. And uh, what did you do that for? That dude called me a nigga. He's like, all right, get back in the game. <laughs> so that, I never was confronted with that growing up as a kid. I got confronted with that in college. Um, so I hope that's not happening with kids when they play. You know, I used to hear about athletes hearing that yelled at them when they played in various sports, you know, whether it's Hank, you know, Aaron or whoever, you know, it was Jesse Owens, you know, whoever. Um, that's not there, thank God. I went to games when Patrick Ewing was playing basketball, and there were signs up, can you read this monkey, this monkey, that. I mean, it was evil. At least I don't see that. Um, so in many ways, that's better. Um, relationships between people, I see a lot more relationships between people of various, quote unquote, nationalities and ethnicities. I don't particularly think those exist. Those were constructs made by humans. Um, there's no such thing as race. We're, we're all earthlings. Um, we're all humans. Um, and, you know, whatever formulated our skin tone and hair, you know, came through evolution and uh, God's plan. But how we relate to each other must be as humans, not as objects. And I too, see too much of the object thing coming back, you know, uh, I, I just want that to end. I want people to love each other, man, and know that whatever direction we go in, you know, solutions are not found found in bombs. Solutions are not found in bullets. They're not found in knives, unless it's knives used to cut food. Um, solutions are, are found in communication, and in communication teach you to appreciate each other. So hopefully we get to that. Hopefully we get to respect, you know, of each other. And I respect you whether I agree with you on everything you say or not. We need to get to some of that instead of, I don't like you, you know, I don't like what you said, you're fired. What? What is that? You know, that can't be why people get fired. I mean, let's get some understanding. If you abuse me now, that's something different. But if you just have a difference of opinion, that's stupid. Well, we're also polarized now. Oh, we're too polarized now. Like I said, our leadership is causing that. You know, our leadership and they're getting too many mics in front of them and, and, and uh, cameras in front of them, making kids think that that's the direction they need to go in. And that's what's scary. That's got to stop. You know, that, 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 that mess is ugly. That's, that's, I went to Rwanda. Rwandans can teach us a lot of things. All this language about calling each other vermin and all these other, you know, these kind of names, you know, pigs and whatever name you want to call somebody other than a human and we'll call them out of their name. That's what they did in Rwanda. And that's what allowed them to create a genocide that killed, you know, like a million people in a few months. I mean, that, that, that's crazy. That's got to stop, man. That's got to stop. But we're going to keep getting worse and worse. This red and blue, this... First of all, what's right and what's wrong. I don't care about what's right and what's progressive. I don't care. I want to know what's right and what's right. Let's go. Let's do what's correct. And correct is what's right. Not just because your opinion is on this side of the fence and your opinion is on that side of the fence. That's some garbage, man. And we're, we're, we're keep getting patrolled. Even the media just keeps using that language. Language is powerful. Words are things. Words are things. That's why I love the writing. And words can shape your mind. And we have to watch our words. Yeah. <laughs> what are you proudest of in your life? What am I proudest of? I'm proudest of my son and my two grandsons that they are making it in this world and hopefully they're gonna make the world a better place, you know? 
I'm proud of my daughter. And I'm proud that they love me, man. You know, I asked my daughter, what you want me to get you for Christmas? This was recently. And she said, I asked about this or that and the other thing. What's her favorite perfume? I, you know, dad, I don't want none of that. I just want to spend the day with my dad. And that, what I'm talking about. Yeah. What are, you, what are your greatest strengths? You have a lot of great strengths, I think. <laughs> Listening. And knowing that I'm just a person in line. Uh, knowing that I can help someone through what they're doing. My, my mom gave me the name Wayne, right? Wayne means burden bearer, comes from the root word of wagon. And when I learned that, it helped me to identify who I was. I was always taught when I was younger, figure out who you are, find out who you are. What's your identity? Who are you? And as I started finding that out and I started doing that and I started understanding my role in, on the planet and being good at that, that gift gives me strength, you know? Uh, it was a song, if I can help somebody, if I can help somebody along the way that my living will not be in vain. I remember hearing that as a kid, my mother singing around the house. And that's one of my strengths, man, just knowing that I can help somebody. And I can help somebody, and I'm willing to do it, willing to do it because people have helped me, man. You know, they've helped me. My my past have had didn't have those people, the right people come along and help me, man. I wouldn't be here talking to you. So confidence is a is an important thing for 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 people, but for men too. Oh especially. confidence, yeah. Confidence comes from doing something the right way many times. You told that story about a certain basketball player who was great in college and then got chastised by his coach, and it was never the same. Man, that's facts, man, especially if you accept that. If you allow people to belittle you, like, I didn't let that dude, you know, think of me as a nigga, you know what I mean? I didn't allow it to happen. I remember one time, I'll tell you another thing, thing about confidence, because you can, you can be falsely confident and stupid, too. <laughs> so when I'm a kid, right, some of my best friends, you know, the Coxon family, you know, they. They, were, they grew up in the projects with me. I lived on the second, they lived on the third floor. And they came, there were three brothers, and they came to me, hey, Wayne, you wanna go swimming? I'm like, sure. I did not know how to swim, but we went to this big public pool we had in Newark, New Jersey. It was down in what they call the ironbound section. And so I'm in the, you know, we're, I'm in the pool, it's three feet deep, and I'm kinda tall, so I'm just watching them swim. Now they could swim, all three of them. And I'm watching, I'm walking along them, doing what they're doing with their hands or what I thought. And so they're like, hey, you wanna go up the high dive? I'm like, yeah, okay, now, cause in the hood, you know, you're not supposed to show, that's a false courage, that you're a punk. You're not supposed to show weakness like that. So I go. <laughs> we go up the ladder, they jump off into the nine feet pool. <sighs> Swan. <laughs> so, so, I mean, all three of them had three different dives. Now it's my turn, I'm the last one. And I'm creeping out on the diving board. And I walk out the edge, man. And I stand there and I go, <laughs> holy shit. But I had the sense to jump up, thank God, to jump up, grab my knees, cannonball into the water, and I doggy paddle to the side. Lifeguard comes over to me and says, I never want to see you in this pool again. Don't ever tell me something that I want to really do. Don't tell me don't do that. So I, I'm kidding. I'm, you know, probably like 11. I'm a Cub Scout. I go to Cubs, Cub Scout camp, and I learn how to swim. I go from being a minnow 
all the way up to being a shark. When I go to college, um, my fresh, freshman year, I took an aquatics class. And I took a water safety and uh, life-saving, became a lifeguard. The very first job I had, I came home from school that summer after my freshman year, was as a lifeguard at that exact pool. So if I want to do something, you got to learn to do it. And in learning to do it and doing it over and over, you become very confident. Yeah. Now nah, I scuba dive, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I got, matter of fact, I got uh, certified in, in Maui. While I was getting certified, I could hear whales above me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see them. I was looking, but I couldn't see them. And the guy that was getting certified with me, Man, he had a camera. He took pictures of him and stuff, man. I got to see him later, but I was, man. So I love, I love the water, man. I, I, you know, I love swimming and being down among the water. It's like water's liquid, liquid air anyway. And that's like a forest under the ocean, man. It's so beautiful. Yeah. But that confidence came from, don't ever want to see the <laughs> fool again. You know, you just stand up. Like I said, you get an obstacle. And you face it, you confront it, and you figure out what you got to do to learn how to get around it, or over it, or th through it, above it, under it, <laughs> and get it done, man. Yeah. There, there have been so many examples of how adversity has created magnificent things in our world. You know, imagine, you know, from, you name every athlete. Michael Jordan tells some of the best stories. But so many great athletes have overcome so much failure and just heartbreaking loss, and then they became champions. Yeah, you can't. And that doesn't apply necessarily just sports. It's everything in life. It's everything in life, man. You can't. That's what I mean. Sometimes, you know, as parents, you, you want to give kids things that you didn't have. And that's not the best way to be a parent, you know. Sometimes it's to give them direction to get what they want rather than giving them what they want. I remember I was helping my... Uh, brother-in-law study one time and my sister-in-law wanted me to just help him do his homework and in her mind helping him do his homework was you know doing it for him basically and I remember like no 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 I remember making him go look that word up in the dictionary what yeah go look it up tell me what it means break it down for me read it in a sentence get, write a sentence for me that way I know you, you know how to use it you know that's how you parent. You teach people how to fish and they'll eat for a lifetime. If you give them fish, they eat for a day. They don't learn how to overcome anything because all they want is what you can give them instead of what they can go get. Speaking of parenting, what, what do you think, what, what, what mistakes do you see being made in, in parenting nowadays? Well, I can tell you something that I made initially. <laughs> I remember one time my, my son told my ex-wife, she said, he, he said, his he and his boy got together and they were like, okay, you tell your mother that's okay for us to go to movies. And I'll tell my mother that your mother said it was okay for us to go to movies. So the parents thought that each mother said okay. But the boys didn't tell all the whole story. So what they were gonna do, and one of them was gonna do was we're gonna meet some girls at this, we're gonna have to take the subway to another city. The next subway stop was New York City, by the way. So when I found out what was going on, I called my dad, I was like, Dad, man, you won't believe what Wayne he did, man. He did it, did it, and my dad said, don't, don't spank him. Now I had only spanked my son twice. And both times my father-in-law said, don't, Use your hand to spank them, because they'll hate you. Use something like a wooden spoon. So I'd only hit him, he was 11 at that point, twice with a wooden spoon spanked him. Because I didn't want him to hate me. I wanted him to hate that object. But my dad said, Wayne, he's too old for that. What you got to do now is you appeal to his logic. Make it make sense. I learned that that has helped me 
the rest of my life with them, even now. Yeah, if my daughter wants to do something that I don't approve of, I don't be like, yo, man, you can't do that, da, da. That's a mistake. If I do that, she gonna do she gonna be like me. I'm gonna prove you. <laughs> I'm gonna prove I can do it that way. That's not cool. You gotta appeal to the logic and then it helps a lot. You know, spanking doesn't work. Showing and making something logical works. I had to learn that. You don't, you know, parenting doesn't, you don't get a degree in that. You don't get a diploma. You don't get a certificate for that. You got to learn it on the job, man. And you got to hope you got mentors that show you some things that, that help you along the way, man. There's no awards. Nah, man. No well, awards? What? The only you might get a smile. The only award get is a the, hug. The only award the kid that stays out of prison. Yeah, that's it. You know, and, and, and grandkids that are doing better than you were at, the, at that age. You know, you, 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 I'm grateful for my son being a good dad, you know. What's easier, having a boy or a girl? <sighs> They're different, completely different, 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 different. Because their feedback is different. Their, what they want to do is different. Uh, for me, it's challenging to be a dad of a girl because I want to be also much more protective. And I got to be careful with that. And she tells me that sometimes. I remember she was going to go into the studio and because she can sing a little bit. She can sing a lot of bit. And she's like, no, Dad, I don't want you to go. Because, <laughs> you know, I'll intimidate those, the creatives. You know, they won't, they won't become, be relaxed and be comfortable because they know that if they step out of line, they'll get hurt. <laughs> and so she knows that. So she, she told me. So I had to learn to watch my boundaries and stuff like that. Whereas my son, I'm just more, you know, they can mess with them if they want to, they go get hurt. So I worry about it. It's just different. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say was one of the toughest things you ever had to go through in your life? Toughest thing I ever had to go through was when I was coaching my high school. I became head coach at 22 years old. And I was pouring myself into these kids, man. I was taking them to basketball camps every summer. I drive all the way to the Poconos, man, an hour each way. Bring one group, drive back, bring another group, drive back, bring them, to teach them basketball, to teach them the things they needed to know. So, Cause we were a very, very competitive program and a very, very competitive uh, league at the time. And we didn't have any money. I mean, I mean the Board of Education was corrupt and you know, I would order a Wilson's basketball, for example, and I, I get a Voight rubber ball instead of the, the leather ball that I wanted. I mean, little things like that. I remember uh, my wife and one of my players' moms. My mom was a seamstress, and I, I learned from her how to make patterns and, you know, make clothes and stuff. So I designed uniforms for my team. And when we raised money. We had a dribble thon dribbled from my high school all the way to City Hall. Did all kinds of things like that to raise money. And on the way, we'd have these number 10 cans, stop at a light, and people would put money in, in, in number 10 cans. And we had a radio station, WNJR at the time, that followed us with their, their radio car and was announcing what we were doing on, on the way. And so I did all kinds of things like that to raise money for, for my, my players to have what we needed. And, and we, I designed the uniforms, my wife and one of my players' moms sewed them together. Two sets of uniforms, home and away, and their warm-ups. I did, I mean, I, I, I moved back into Newark so my players could walk to my house within 20 minutes. Um, the furthest one lived 20 minutes away. The other one, one lived, you know, two houses over. I, I poured myself into these kids because I wanted to be like my coach. My coach, my coaches, there were three high school coaches I had that I were just <sighs> dynamite, man. Actually, four. And um, they were exceptional. So I just wanted to be as good as them. If I knew if I, if, I could, if I could duplicate what they did, all these boys have a chance. And, man, when I got my best team, my best team, I made a mistake. The mistake I made was... I had two players on the team, on my JV team. We won the city championship. I had two players on my JV team that were using drugs. 
I smoking marijuana pretty pretty heavily and I had a meeting with them after the season was over. I said, look, man, I know you're the leading rebounder. I know you're my leading scorer. We need you next year, but you got to stop doing that or you won't make the team. Now, mind you, I had 50 kids trying out about every year to make five spots. So the first 25 is easy to cut. The next 10, a little bit more difficult. The last 10 of that group, real hard to cut because they're almost the same. You know, you got five players, you know, each playing two different positions, playing a specific position, two of each position. So to get which one to pick is about chemistry and some other thing, listenability. Anyway, long story short, the first day of practice that year, they didn't listen to me. Now, I grew up there, so I mean, I knew everybody. I was in touch with everybody. I was in touch with the street as well as politicians. I, I knew everybody. So I was kept hearing they kept doing it. I warned them again in September. Look, man, try us in October, baby. They kept doing it. First day, tryouts. After the trial was over, everybody in the bleachers. Usually I cut half of y'all. You know that. Today I'm only cutting two. Fonzie, Steve. Remember like it was yesterday. You're the only two I'm cutting today. This is why. Told the group, because one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. So I'm thinking I'm doing my job. I'm thinking I'm doing a great job. In fact, in fact I helped these kids become eligible. I made sure they had to have a, at least a 2.5 GPA all through their years to be able to play on the team, all kind of stuff. And they, all of them were excelling that. I'm raising gentlemen, you know, and I didn't realize I was up, you know, messing up the apple cart a little too much. I was upsetting some of the drug dealers and people in town that were, they like to have these athletes be the ones who are their spokespeople, their, their example setters of what to do wrong because they'll get more customers because people look up to them. I, I wasn't paying attention to all those things at that time. I, you know, I was just doing my job, man. Blinders on. And, uh, after that season was over, the mayor's wife, her husband wanted my job. Football coach was jealous of me. I was a young man. I was a student when he was first coaching. I never played for him because I loved playing basketball. And uh, I had some of my players play for him if they wanted to. He wanted me to make them play back. I'm like, no, I'm not going to make you play football. If you want to play it, you play it. I mean, I didn't. nobody made me do anything. He didn't like it. He was jealous of me. Anyway, it was a bunch of people. They all conspired. They transferred me to another school. I was broken. Dan Warwick had a song, I know I'll never love this way again. I know I'll never, can't sing like her, love this way again, but hold on. I had to do that, man. I had to find a way to hold on, man. My kids went to the Board of Education, they went to the principal, they went to everybody, tried to keep me at the job. And they were like, there were items on the cash register, man. They had eight guys trying to coach my kids, man. My kids just did what I taught them already. <laughs> I talked to one not that long ago, the one that Larry Bird helped get a scholarship. And he said, Coach, we didn't listen to a thing they had to say, man. <laughs> we were doing what you taught us. <laughs> it was too many of them. We would get whiplash listening to this one say this, this one say that, and, you know, and, you know, and uh, but I still helped them. The ones that were mine, I helped them get scholarships. And, uh, but that was very, very hard. So for a while, I didn't want nothing to do with basketball. I played tennis, man, like crazy. Six hours a day, but I always came back to basketball. I was a kid, show me how to do this. And uh, that kept me, that kept me, that in my faith. That was the hardest thing for me to do was to get out of that, that trauma, that was real hard. But then again, if that hadn't happened, 
Look at all these kids that wouldn't have helped. So God knew more than I knew. But what does it take for someone to be a to really be a standout? Is it something that's genetic or is it the heart that they just develop from their mentors and parents? You got to do what you love so much. That's not work, man. You just want to go do it. My mother I never had to worry about where I was. Like, go down there. When's it the play girl? Go get him. Tell him it's time to eat. I mean, you just you just do it, and you just and you want to learn, right? Like, you want to be the best at whatever you do. That's what I was always taught. I don't care if you want to clean the street. You be the best street cleaner there is, and you'll always be in demand. And so, whatever I do, whatever I did, whatever they do, whatever they've done. If they're great, they just want to be the best at it. And they'll do what they have to do to get that information to become the best. And if you're around a lot of, a lot of really good people that are doing that and you want to be better than them, you want to learn what they're doing, study what they're doing, pay attention. You know, no one has too much money or too little money to pay attention. You want to pay attention and then you want to be better than that. You want to outwork them. And everybody that I know has been great, has outworked everybody. I remember Coach Costello, was, I was at a basketball camp, and he was coaching Oscar Robertson and um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He said this at the camp. I never forgot, and I, I echoed in me. He said, those are the two hardest working players I've ever seen. They work harder than everybody I've ever been around. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, and they won a championship. <laughs> For Milwaukee Bucks. So that's it's, it's not magic, man. It's about work. It's about figuring out what you gotta do to become the best at it and go get it. That's it. Are there people that you see with pot- young young people with, with potential that just drop the ball for some reason? Yeah. <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Sometimes their parents get in the way. Sometimes their friends get in the way. Sometimes the environment that they live in gets in the way. I had a kid, man, when I first came out here. Played for Crenshaw High School. Another kid that went to a little small school, Pacific Hills High. And uh, he used to have these rules about how they had to do things. and, And I wanted to make sure that they were obedient to their parents, that they were good at home, they cleaned up their room, they did their homework. And I, as I told one of my friends, Steve, and I said, man, make sure Brandon always does his homework, make sure his room is clean all the time, don't let him go anywhere if he doesn't do that. And his mom was like, nah, Cause she, you know, she was the daughter of a celebrity and she, you know, she could do whatever she wanted. So it was, it was always, tug of war with them. She used to wonder why I was so hard on Brandon. One night, the other kid, his name was Lloyd, came over, beep, 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 beep. Come on, Brandon, let's go, let's go do something that I'm, you know, let's go for a ride. And Brandon asked his dad, could he go? His dad said, did you do your homework? What's your room look like? No, you can't go. Well, that night, Lloyd got arrested. tough situation so his coach from Crenshaw High School goes to the police and says hey man you know the kid just got caught up you know and da 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 and, you know release him on my recognizance I'll take care and make sure he's okay and it was all good during the basketball season when the season was over Lloyd went to back to gang bang and acting stupid next thing I know top of the Fox Hills Mall is in a shootout with the cops he's dead that's the problem or you got a problem with kids whose parents think that they are so good, they are the goose that laid the golden egg. And they do, they get in their own kids' way. I remember one time George Raveling was at an event. I went to this event. All the basketball aficionados in LA were at this gym, Southwest College. And I remember walking over to Coach Raveling and saying, hey, I got this kid, I don't wanna say his name. He's seven feet tall. 10th grade, he's a combination of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Tim Duncan, and he can shoot the three. I don't care. 
His veins were popping in his neck. His forehead. That kid is never going to be a pro. I was like, what? He's in, I was like, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe he, because George Rabin was somebody I looked up to for a very, very long time. Well, it took me to find out that, you know, the kid had moved into my house with his mom, and they were, she gave me the story about her husband and was this, that, and the third, and they were trying to figure out how to make it and this and that. I didn't realize that she had been taking money from this person, that person, and the other person. Next thing I know, we're, gonna, we're not going to stay at your house tonight. We're going to go away for the weekend. We're going to stay in a hotel. Okay. I get a phone call from Vegas. They're in Vegas. They're going to go to school at Durango High School. I'm like, what? <laughs> Long story short, never happened. They got in a car accident, and uh, he never really healed. And the kid was a wonderful human being. I mean, terrific, fantastic, phenomenal kid. And he tried to come back to L.A. to go to Westchester High School. And he hadn't healed yet. And his mother was, again, trying to you know, tell the coaches what to do. And they were like, we're going to apply for him to get an extra year of high school because he had the injury and, you know, they'll, they'll understand. And they got the extra year, which is extremely difficult to get. Well, someone else asked to go down to Orange County, go to school. She tried to do that. And she didn't understand that the rules of the state of California say if we get you an extra year, you got to go to the school that applied for it for you. So they got stuck. That kid didn't play any more basketball in high school after he left me. Yeah. Seven feet tall. Rest of his life. You play basketball? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, if I would have, could have, should have, but because that's the rest of his life, man. And not his fault. You believe in fate? I don't know. I have no idea what mine's going to be. <laughs> I just think you just keep going, man, and, and uh, try to be the best person you can be because I believe that if, you, if you're not a good person, your, your end is not going to be good. It's not going to be kind. I kind of believe that. I believe in karma. Karma. Yeah. I don't know about fate. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> Can't answer that. You make your own. You make your own, baby. Yeah. You got to navigate your life, man. By your choices you make. Yeah. yeah. That determines which direction you're going to go in, man. And usually the way you want to go is not where everyone's going. You know, because everyone, they take the easy way, most people. And being being a great athlete has more than just has more to do than just the athletic ability. Sometimes the personality, sometimes the all of that man. choices that people make get in the all way of that, man. You gotta be careful what you. I, I tell my athletes, your body is a temple. Don't put anything in your temp in your temple that you won't want want to take into your church, your mosque, your synagogue, you know, your masjid. You don't 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 put anything in there that you wouldn't bring in there. You know, and that's a, that's kind of a good guiding rule. You know, don't bring dudes in there that you wouldn't want to bring in there. You know, um, don't bring a girl in there dressed the way you want. Want you know what I mean? Don't don't have that around you. I mean, be be nice. To, don't be above everyone. Don't do that. You know, be nice to everyone. Be respectful to everyone. But you know, you, you hang out with dogs, you're gonna get fleas. You know, if you wanna. Fly with the, the eagles and soar with them. You can't hang out with the owls at night. You got to make those kind of choices that are going to take you to greatness. Last time I checked, you know, my son's middle name is Eagle, right? It's, it's Tai. That's that means eagle in Swahili. Because last time I checked, it, I have never seen eagle on a grocery store shelf. And eagles can fly from one continent to another. <laughs> That's why his middle name is Tai. Yeah. And he named my grandson, my firstborn grandson, that too. Yep. Where do you go from here? What's your, what's, what's, what do you see in your life in the future? How old, how old are you? I am 71 this You're year. You're 71? I'll be, 
<laughs> I'll be 72 in June. Bye. I am going to, my goal is to make 10 of me. 10 writers, 10 phenomenal skills trainers for basketball, 10 producers, 10 directors. That's my goal. If I do that, then I'm happy. Through mentoring. Yep. An example, being it. That's all I got, man. <laughs> Unless you got another question. No, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> all right. Wayne, great talking with you again. Yeah. My always, pleasure, man. Thank you for asking. Always interesting. You are their hope. You are the reason they let people shit on them, piss on them, the whole ride over here on that damn boat, squeeze on each other like sardines. But they made it. So you can become somebody great. You are their dreams. You better not give in to drugs. You better not talk about stealing from people. You better make sure that we got it. Yeah. That's why I'm here.